So friends, this is now the 11th session that we are having in our study of the book of Revelation. And we've now finished reading the letters to the seven churches. And I, I think that the most important thing in these letters is that each of these churches is being encouraged or exhorted to conquer by living out their faith in Jesus Christ as the one true Lord. And they're encouraged to do this with patient endurance, even though their communities will most certainly rise up against them with their own claims that it's the emperor or it's the nation or it's, it's wealth or one of the other gods that are the real Lord. And the Christians then are to witness to Jesus' lordship humbly, but with no apologizing and no compromising of their positions to their loyalty towards Christ. So now that Jesus has dictated these letters to John and instructed him to take them to the guardian angels of the seven churches, Jesus calls John a little bit deeper into his vision. And at this point, I'm going to want to try something a little bit different in our study. In the past sessions, we have uh, mostly taken kind of a verse-by-verse -verse approach to our text. But this week, I think what I'd like to do is to start by reading the entire chapter as a whole before we get into the specifics. And I want to do this just so that you can hear it all as a piece and perhaps get a, a picture of it in your imagination as John paints it for us. So here is the fourth chapter of the book of Revelation. After this, I looked, and there in heaven a door stood open. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there in heaven stood a throne, with one seated on the throne. And the one seated there looked like jasper and carnelian, and around the throne is a rainbow that looks like an emerald. Around the throne are twenty-four thrones, and seated on the thrones are twenty-four elders dressed in white robes with golden crowns on their heads. Coming from the throne are flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And in front of the throne burn seven flaming torches, which are the seven spirits of God. In front of the throne, there is something like a sea of glass, like crystal. Around the throne and on each side of the throne are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with a face like a human face, and the fourth living creature like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and inside. Day and night, without ceasing, they sing, Holy, 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 the Lord God the Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to the one who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall before the one who is seated on the throne and worship the one who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, singing, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created." So we have this scene where the same voice that had spoken to John earlier with a, a sound like a trumpet, and we remember that this voice belonged to Jesus, now calls him once again. And he notices an open door, which kind of links to the imagery that we've had earlier as we've seen Jesus as the, the key bearer who has the power to open doors and no one can close them or closed doors, and no one can open them. And the one who has the authority to usher those that he deems worthy into the very presence of the great king. And Jesus tells John he's going to show him what 
must take place after this. And, and I think that this is kind of an interesting statement, at least in the manner in which it's spoken. It's not exactly like this is what God wants to do. It can just as easily be interpreted as uh, this is the plight that the world has gotten itself into, and this is how God is going to moderate the outcome of that. And John says that immediately he was in the Spirit, which, once again, we know means that he isn't thinking that he was actually physically in the throne room of God. But John understands this whole episode as a vision that he's been granted, something that he can imagine through the Spirit. And the main thing that John notices is the throne of God in heaven. And there's one seated on it. But we notice that John doesn't really go into much detail at all in trying to describe how this God looks to us. He just really gives us flashes of color in a sense of the quality of the experience. He says in verse 3, And the one seated there looks like jasper and carnelian, and around the throne is a rainbow that looks like an emerald. So I have to admit, I had to look up a couple of those stones in order to see what they look like. And, and I found that all of them were gemstones that would have been familiar to folks through the traders that passed along these trade routes. Jasper can take a range of forms and colors, but was most typically a red agate-like stone. And carnelian is a, a red gemstone. Emerald, of course, is a, a green, beautiful gemstone. The image of God then is this robust red with this green rainbow encircling God. Of course, we can't be too literal with the, the colors or anything else here. We have to train ourselves to remember that this vision is not about a literal image of God and heaven and what's to come. It's a poetic image in which colors and stones and, and animals and lampstands and, and whatever else they're there to give us a feel for a spiritual reality that's beyond our words, beyond our comprehension, perhaps even beyond our imagination. So with the gemstones, it's not just their colors. It's also their solidness, their depth, their translucence, the glow, their richness, their hardness, their purity, their many facets even, in, in, in the way that they cast these shimmering lights about themselves. All of these things enter into the poetry of this vision. But I think it's significant that John sees this rainbow around the one central throne, and he recognizes it as a rainbow, even though he describes it like a, a gemstone, like an, an emerald. And the significance of the rainbow is, of course, that it was the sign that God gave us after the flood that God would never again wipe out the world as God was said to have done in the days of Noah. The rainbow, that's the sign of mercy. It's a reminder that God will always temper God's wrath. And that's the first thing that John notices that fills the room around God. So right from the beginning, it's like John is warning us. Now, this vision may get a bit dark. It's going to get violent. The ride might be a bit bumpy at times. But remember this. God is first and foremost committed to the ideal of mercy, even when it may not be apparent to us how that works. And now John notices that around that central throne, the one that's encircled by that rainbow, there are 24 more thrones and I think that the vision is that these are uh, concentric circles in which God's throne is in the very center, and then that rainbow surrounds God, and then those 24 thrones encircle the rainbow and God. And the 24 elders, they're only, again, described in passing. They're wearing white, and they have crowns, and that's about it in terms of a description of them. So some say that these are the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel, and included with them are the 12 apostles. Others say that these are leaders from among those who conquered by passing through the persecutions, as Jesus had called them to do in his earlier letters. 
but their specific identity doesn't seem to be really a, a concern for John. I think it's really more about their location and their focus. They're wearing brilliant clothes, robes of righteousness perhaps, and they have crowns, so they may be uh, victors or, or kings or champions of the people. But the main thing is that they encircle God, they're right around God, and their focus is entirely directed on God. And that reinforces the power and the authority of the one on that central throne. Now we're told in verse 5, Coming from the throne are flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And this would have drawn out images of God's presence on earth. Almost everywhere we see God coming to earth on Mount Sinai in the wilderness and, and in the visions of God coming to speak to the, the prophets, God's presence is accompanied by thunder and lightning and smoke and fire. So these symbols remind us that this is the same awesome God who did powerful things for us on earth so very long ago. And in front of the throne burn seven flaming torches, which are the seven spirits of God. And we've previously wrestled with the meaning of the seven spirits of God. Are they aspects of the one Holy Spirit, or are they different orders of heavenly beings? Personally, I've come down to thinking that they are to be seen as seven specific angels or spirits that can be sent to and fro to do the bidding of God. And in front of the throne, there's something like a sea of glass, like crystal. So now, this is really quite interesting. From the earliest mention of the sea in the Bible, it's seen as something wild and dangerous and chaotic. The sea was where storms arose and killed fishermen and sailors and, and travelers. The sea was where ships were, were lost and the mighty sea monsters like Leviathan lived. And part of the poetic theology of John seems to be that God will not have fully tamed this world and made it a, a perfectly peaceful habitation until God overcomes and destroys the sea itself. And later we're going to find that there will be no sea in John's vision of heaven. And I have to say, as one who has always loved the sea, I just can't take that bit literally. For me, there's something just absolutely heavenly about being on the sea or on the seashore, walking the beach, seeing what the tide brought in, breathing in the salt air, swimming in the shallows, sailing, fishing, all those things belong in my vision of heaven. But obviously this isn't about my vision of heaven. This is about John's vision. And, and I think that even in John's vision of heaven, it's not so much about the literal destruction of the seas as it is the poetic image. I think it's about the idea that God will one day create a kingdom of absolute peace and joy in which we need never again fear any of the chaos and dangers of this earth that we had known before. So this sea, it now sits before God almost like a, a puppy in abject deference to its master. And the sea, it's not foaming, it's not raging, it's like crystal, totally obedient, totally passive before God. And now John sees the four living creatures standing on each side of the throne. And the image of these creatures, it's lifted from the, the vision that Ezekiel had long before John. But in Ezekiel's vision, there was one creature that had four faces, had a lion's face, an ox's face, a human's face, and an eagle's face. But in John's vision, instead of one creature with four faces, there are four creatures, each having one of the faces that Ezekiel had seen so long ago. As far as why the four listed here, well, it 
might just be that that's how Ezekiel saw it, so that's how John might have wanted us to imagine it in order to keep his vision in continuity with the Old Testament's vision. Or it might be that these creatures represented four aspects of creation that John saw as significant. Maybe the lion for its regal bearing and its fierceness, the ox for its domestic usefulness, the human perhaps to include us in the scene, and the eagle for its speed and its vision, its power in flight. I also wonder if it might have had a significance in terms of taking images that were worshipped by other communities and subjugating them to the one true God. The early Canaanites, they worshipped Baal in the form of a bull. The Egyptians, they included a lion among their deities. The eagle was the official symbol of Rome's military might and both the Greeks and the Romans included many human-like gods in their daily worship. It's also true that at some point, each of these living creatures become associated with one of the gospel writers, and thus Matthew was focused on Jesus' genuine humanity, and thus Matthew would be the one associated with the human face. Mark, the lion, because he often portrayed God as the king. Luke often showed us Christ as our servant, and thus perhaps that picture of the domesticated ox that serves humanity would fit. And John is said to be the eagle, because apparently the eagle was believed to be able to look directly into the sun. And in like manner, it said that John would call us to look unflinchingly into eternity. Now, on my part, I, I'd say that anyone can take these symbols and make them fit into a pattern after they've been written down. The real question is what they meant to John when he wrote them and what they might have meant to his audience when they first heard them. And, and that's going to be a lot trickier to figure out. At this point, perhaps, it's, it's not even possible anymore. At any rate, each of the four living creatures also has six wings, and it's covered with eyes on the inside as well as on the outside. Again, the imagery here might indicate that they had an incredible ability to fly at great speeds and thus be just instantly wherever God needed them to do the work of God. And the eyes on the inside and the outside might indicate that they go about seeing everything that there is to see from every angle there is to see it from. Even those things that we think are hidden deep within us, nothing can escape God's creatures with all of those eyes. But the main thing that we're told that they do is to worship God as they sing, Holy, 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 the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whatever else these creatures might do, their main purpose is the praise of the one on the throne. And this reminds us of what our main purpose is as well. And the words of praise that they lift remind us that God has always been, is now, and not only that God evermore shall be, but specifically that God will come again. And that's central to John's theology. And we're told that whenever these living creatures sing out their praise, the 24 elders throw themselves out of their thrones and, and they join in the song of worship as they cast their crowns at the feet of God, singing, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. So the casting of their crowns before God's throne, it's a, a gesture of submission and loyalty, such as a conquered king or, or queen might do as a public act after they had seen that this other king had come in and, and maybe conquered or had a greater army and uh, maybe had a better claim on the power and authority than they had. 
So these elders, they cast their crowns before God, suggesting that no matter how high and mighty they might have been in their own right, they now see themselves as humble vassals of the true God. And I have to say, I totally get how significant and majestic this all is, but, but even so, I tend to see this almost like one of those loops on a social media video where we see a, a short clip of action that just goes on and on and on. So I see these living creatures sing out their holy, 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 and the elders diving out of their thrones onto their knees, singing their song and throwing their crowns at the feet of God. And then they're magically back up on their 24 thrones with their 24 crowns on their 24 heads. And the creatures, they start singing their song again. And the elders, they jump out of their thrones again and sing their songs and cast their crowns again at the feet of God. And it goes on and on and on. It's ceaseless. And while I get uh, what they're trying to say here in John's uh, revelation, I have to say that after a while, I think that if I were one of those elders, I'd be looking at the living creatures thinking, oh, come on, man, give us a break. But alas, that too is taking this vision too literally. The real idea here is that these heavenly and earthly creatures of great power and renown are worshiping God from the depths of their hearts and finally placing all of their energies and all of their focus continually on the God who drew everything into being and has all the, the rights to the worship that they're giving and all the worship that we also should be giving as well. So, you know, I, I think that that probably brings us to the end of the fourth chapter and the end of our time for today. Uh, there's obviously much more that could be said about this from many other angles, uh, but at least perhaps this is a, a start at looking at this. I'd ask now that you join me in a word of prayer. Lord God, you indeed are holy and you alone are worthy of all of our praise for your power, for your might, for your patience and compassion, we thank you. And we pray that we, like the elders and creatures in the throne room of John's vision, would join in praising you from the bottom of our hearts for the gift of creation, for our very existence, and that we too would devote ourselves to you and you alone as our King, our Creator, our Sovereign, and our God, now and forever. Amen. Friends, once again, I want to thank you for joining me for this time of, of study and prayer. I pray that you're blessed with these images that John has created for us uh, through his vision of who God is and what uh, the throne room of God is like and, and how we too might join in the worship of our God. And let's remember that Worship isn't just something we do on Sunday mornings. Uh, it's something that is uh, an attitude that we have throughout our days, throughout our all of our time in this life. And so let's go out into this world uh, and do the things that we need to do, but do them with that attitude of praise and worship to our God who deserves all the praise constantly through our days, through our nights. And let's do it with joy in the name of our Lord. Amen.